Ali Habib, and this is Our American Stories, and it's time for our American Dreamers series. And always, it's sponsored by the great folks at the Job Creators Network. And Job Creators is hard at work trying to promote policies that help and aid Main Street businesses across this country. Big businesses are well represented in Washington, D.C., and often they're trying to thwart the efforts of small ones. And big versus small is a big theme on this show as is up versus down, and always we're fighting for the little guy and for those small business owners across this country on Main Streets trying to turn their little businesses into bigger ones. And today, our own Alex Cortez brings us the story of someone that you likely know, my pillow founder, Mike Lindell, but you likely don't know his full and remarkable story. People always say, how ironic, you were a cocaine addict and you invented something to sleep. In 2008, um, my dealers, they did an intervention on me. I get downtown Minneapolis and all three of them are in the room. I go, what are you guys doing here? Now I'm in a worst part of Minneapolis in in the one guy's apartment, Joe's second apartment. I said, you guys know each other? I'm up for 14 days or, you know, they said it was 19, it's 14. (laughs) And uh, the one guy says, he goes, he goes, what am I here for? And he goes, he goes, well, Mike's been up 19 days and we're shutting him off. And and, uh, I said, I've only been up 14. And he says, you've been with us the whole time. You know, they all, they all knew I hadn't slept. And the one guy leaves, he says, he ain't getting nothing from any of my people or me. And he was just disgusted and left. And they, before he left, though, he goes, you made a promise to us. Because all the time when I'd be doing drugs and stuff, I would always promise them this is a platform that's going to help. When I quit, I'm going to come back and, they, and help everyone, you know, get out of this horrific addiction and everything. There were many times I was in crack houses or bars, whatever, and I would talk about Revelation, which I had read about when I was ever in jail. You know, every time I was in jail, I'd read the Bible. That's about the only time I would, you know. And so I'm telling these guys, well, they would quit that day, the next day. Like 28 people quit all through my life. I'm going, but what did I say? And they go, I don't know, but it sure made sense. Well, normally you would think it's a hypocrite. Yeah, this is really bad. Give me another line, you know. And and they would, they would lift it. But all that time, it was me telling them, trying to convince myself, you know trying to convince myself whether it would be Jesus or whether it would be to get off the drugs. It was me trying to convince myself. So anyway, these guys are in the middle of this intervention thing and the one guy kicks the other guy, Joe, out of his own apartment and he sits there in the chair next to me, says, how much you have left? And I had, I don't know, enough to probably uh, last an hour or so. And he sits there and, I, and now I, I run out and I'm scraping the pipe. Anybody that's on crack out there, you're scraping the residue out of the pipe and re-smoking it and trying to, then you're looking on the ground all over the carpet trying to find pieces you may have dropped over the last few days. And it's horrific. And then uh, anyway, I look over and he's asleep. So I head on down to the streets. I'm the only white guy down there. I'm, and they're going, you ain't getting nothing from me. You're not getting nothing from me. And, and I mean, all these things they're saying, I'm going, how do they know it's me? And all, my buddy, Joe, that he just, he goes, yeah, he goes, Mike didn't realize we told him, you know, if a, if a crazy white guy comes down with a mustache, you know. <laughs> so Joe just told this story the other day, and he, because he works for, now he's a Christian, he works for my company. And he, so anyway, I get back to the room, and I defeat it, and I get in there, and, and uh, he's sitting in the chair, and he says, uh, how'd that work out for you? And I said, I was so mad, and I said, you know, it was like 2.30 in the morning, 3 in the morning. And he goes, he goes, give me your phone. He says, you're gonna take, you're gonna take this picture. You told us you're gonna write a book. You're gonna need this for your book. It's like think of someone on 14 days in a mugshot or whatever, but it times that by five, you know. Mike believes that his drug addiction was all because of his parents' divorce. 100 percent 100 percent Everything in childhood, everything in childhood, trauma. Everything affects it, manifests to addictions, manifests to personality disorders, a divorce, but a divorce, a fatherlessness, it affects everybody. This was not known back then. I mean, it was very rare, you know. My mom and dad divorced when I was seven. I was nine days into second grade, brought to a new school. Um, I was the oldest child, so I was babysitting at seven. It was... Uh, to fit into the new school, I, you know, I did a lot of crazy things to, you know, climbing out a moving bus window to show off. And uh, I worked at a drive-in th- movie theater, and the drive-in movie theater was voted the best job to have in the 1970s. One time I remember climbing up the back of the screen, 
and on these little rungs and me and my buddy that worked there were gonna moon the crowd and we stand up there we're 160 feet off the ground and I'm afraid of heights we hang onto the screen and now I couldn't get back up and I'm gonna fall to my death and my and my clothes fall out my pants fall off so he's helping me trying to get back up and he gets me back up and I just petrified climbing back down. Of course, the police were waiting at the bottom and they're going, and this is the 1970s, they're going, he goes, uh, my manager's there, he goes, these guys work here. He goes, oh, this, you know, and the guy, they go, you get back out there, don't do that again and get your clothes. I mean, that was it. But you look back now, I'm going, you know, all those people watching, he goes, is that part of the movie, you know? And uh, I did a lot of different things like that. And I know a lot of it was uh, was out of boredom, you know, um, just things to do. I wanted, you know, just excitement. Even though I, even though I get myself into trouble, it was exciting and it was challenging getting out of trouble, you know. <laughs> Mike went on to college, although he didn't know why. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I talked about maybe being a lawyer, you know, and all these different things, but I didn't know what I wanted to be, and it was like, that was the thing to do, go to college. And I had, I, I didn't go to class. I went to class twice. I was working two jobs. My roommate's going, uh, what are you even here for? And I would just go take the test and still get C's at not even doing anything. And that was the year of the uh, Iranian uh, crisis, the hostage crisis. And as soon as that happened, I used it as an excuse. I'm out of here. The you know, world's coming to an end or whatever. I'm, I'm going to go have fun while he's gone, you know. I just thought it was a waste of time. I mean, I'm going, it's a repeat of high school, these things. And my whole thought process, why do you have to go four years of this um, general college and then to be a, a doctor or a lawyer, or whatever you want to be? And that bothered me. I'm not going to sit here and waste my time. That's the way I thought. So he put his attention elsewhere. Working at the grocery store, I got heavy into illegal sports betting. And I uh, was betting with some very bad people on sports, and I ended up owing them a lot of money. And they came to my trailer and left a note. He said, if you don't pay by tonight, things are going to get very physical. That night, I went to work at the grocery store, and I told my manager, I said, Lenny, I said, if if anybody comes through the door here and looks like they might be in the mafia or whatever, it looks like these, I say, so we say Mike telephone line three. We only had two telephone lines. I wasn't even there three minutes. And I said, and I hear Mike telephone line three and out the back door I went and I went and got their money the next morning and paid them. Little things like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And more on this remarkable story, Mike Lindell's story here on Our American Stories. This is Our American Stories. We return to our American Dreamers series, this time Mike Lindell. And we return at this point. He's dropped out of college. He's working at a grocery store and for the owner's son, who was his manager. I had been uh, fired. It was union. I'd been fired. I don't know how many times the union got my job back or, or his dad did. And uh, it would always be over stuff that uh, I didn't like his rules. And he goes, if you don't like it, you know, get your own company someday and make your own rules. And there were so many things I didn't like as an employee back then. And I've, I've changed a lot of that now to my own company yeah. where to make things better. And he, he said the, the final the thing he did that where he finally fired me, I was, I was on five different schedules. And one of them I knew I was probably on, but I didn't want to look at it because I was seeing my cousin that I hadn't seen in years. <laughs> And uh, anyway, the next day I come in and he's working to me. He says, you've been suspended indefinitely. And I said, I don't, what does that mean? I, I like, like, you know, I didn't realize that you're done. You know, I didn't know what the words meant. And uh, so I said, yeah, we'll see about this. So I went to his dad and he said, he looked at me, he says, Mike, I'm not, I'm not getting behind you this time. He says, you're destined for bigger things. He says, you're going to look back someday and see this was meant to be. And he says, you can't be a lifer here, even though, and, and they had both told me I'm one of their best employees, but I just had problems. And uh, I'll never forgot them words. I looked back and it wasn't too long looking back going, well, you know, wow, that had to happen. Or I might still have been there for years later, you know. But it would take more than one incident to really kick in Mike living a real life. 
My fifth year reunion with my class, everyone's now is out of the college. They get these amazing jobs. They've started families or they've kept with the same company since high school. In my mind, they were way ahead of me. And it was very, it was bothering me inside. And then it was just a, going, wow, everybody's ahead of me. And I'm doing stuff to show off. And I'm, you know, I got into, you know, I was a card counter. Then I took a card counting class, professional card counter. But I hadn't even started it yet or whatever. I just threw it at the class. So I'm, I'm bragging it at the reunion about skydiving with a parachute not opening and my car accidents and my, you know, card counter, things that they've never seen or the mafia coming after me, you know, so I'm blowing their minds. And so we don't get on the topic of, uh, yeah, how you doing for work? How you doing? Uh, you know, what are you doing, Mike? How many kids you got? How many, know, how's your family? You know, I'm just completely putting up this wall, you know, for these other things. And so they're all thinking I'm nuts basically. But it was a very, it was, that starting there it was a very much a driver. And it was like, I, there was a lot of, now it started to be shame. You know, I'm going, you know, this is, this is not who I can be. Then then I prayed, I said, you know, God, all I want is to meet the right woman and have, you know, kids and, and uh, you know, be the, the white picket fence, so to speak. And then God brought that all to me and handed it to me on a silver platter. Until Mike jeopardized his answered prayer. By then I was a very functioning cocaine addict too. I look back and I'm going, oh, it was perfect. Well, no, there was a lot of dysfunction, even though it's hard to, for the addiction to, to hide it all the time. The kids didn't even know then. That's how good I was. I mean, it was a lot of work hiding the, the cocaine and then, the, and then crack. The kids didn't know, okay? Even like neighbors, let's give our kids, or send our kids over there because we were the fun, you know, this is back in the, you know, when they were younger and was with cocaine. But then when the crack came on, that took us down fast when the cocaine turned into crack. And and the kids, my daughter at that time, when we, we got, right when it all kind of blew up, uh, she says, we're very dysfunctional family. I go, I don't know what that means, but don't ever say that again. We're not dysfunctional. It's a swear word, what do you mean? What? It sounded just horrible. I didn't know what it really, really meant, you know? And, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> so that don't sound great. But I lost it all. You know, I eventually lost it all. And in the midst of a lot of this dysfunction, Mike was already running my pillow. I tried every pill. Even when I was 16 years old, I bought one of my first paychecks, went to buy a pillow at that grocery store I worked at. This teenager spent $70 on a pillow. That would be $287 in today's money for a pillow. So I spent the most expensive pillow thinking it would be the best. It was a down pillow and it was the worst because, you know, I know now they just sell us air. I mean, I mean, how can that be? It feels good, down it goes, but I couldn't return it. That I do remember. They would not let me return that pillow. But then throughout my life, I'm trying different pillows and I always had problems with sleep and wake up in the morning, headache, neck ache. But most of these sleep interruptions are not being able to get to sleep right away. So in, in 2004, I had a very clear dream of the name, my pillow, and I wrote my pillow all over the house and, and connecting the Y and the P and, and you know, these logos and I'm going, that sounds really corny, you know, um, but I go, well, where's my pillow? You know, I mean, if you, it's hard for you to think back now because there's my everything and it was because of my pillow got big, everybody took up the my's, but my daughter came upstairs and there was, she looked and there were pieces of paper written all over and Lizzie says, uh, she gets a glass of water, she, I don't know, she's 11 years old maybe, and she said, what are you doing, Dad? And I go, I go, I'm gonna invent this pillow. And I and now you realize I hadn't even got the, you know, what, what it's gonna be made of or what it's gonna do. It's gonna be the best thing ever, I've seen it, and, and this is gonna be called my pillow. And she looks at all these pieces of paper, she goes, that's really random, Dad, and she went back downstairs. Well, then the kids said to their mother at the time, when's dad going to get over this pillow thing? And uh, he says, oh, it's just a phase. It'll be, it'll be over. And I wasn't, at that time, I wasn't doing anything. I'd sold my I'd little bar and restaurant. So my total focus was on this pillow now. Well, then I still had to figure out the material. So we tried over 94 different kinds of foams and fills to put in there. My one son, Darren, and I, he was now managing 1,100 or 1,200 employees of the manufacturing. That's what he does now. But he's like nine or 10 years old and 
every day we'd get home from school and we'd try different kinds of stuff on the deck and the foam would fly all over the neighborhood and we tried little machines to get to work and finally we get it and it worked. Once we had the pillows all made, we had mortgaged our house, everything, and we had no money left, but we had like 300 pillows. And I went into the first pillow, I walked into a, it was a bed, bath, and beyond, I'll just say the name. In Bloomington, Minnesota, I go in there, I said, I got the best pillow ever. I said, this pillow is gonna change, you know, change, you're gonna sell more of this than anything. It helps this, helps you sleep, blah, blah, blah. And where, where's your buyer? Who's your buyer? Where's the manager? And he looks at me, he goes, you need to leave. And I'm going, the guy just had all this passion, you know? And I'm going, what do you mean I need to leave? I said, I want to talk to your buyer. And I learned right away. And I started calling on other stores and everybody. It was the same shutout. My brother-in-law's brother said, Mike, why don't you do a kiosk? And I said, what's that? How do you spell kiosk? And then we did this kiosk. And I had a little sign, a stencil, where I put on family owned and operate. I colored in the, the stencil. And the other one I put, chiropractor recommended. And she goes, his then wife. We can't have this. She goes, someone can sue us. I said, I gave one to a chiropractor, our friend, you know, and he loves it, you know. But it was way far, you know, here's a mall and here's this in a mall. It just was almost too corny, you know what I mean? Almost too real. But I did, we did sell about 80 pillows. And the one day, obviously we lost, uh, I don't know, like $15,000 because it's very expensive to have a kiosk on November and December. And, but one guy, he came up and he said, hey, you have a, do you have a card? And I go, I don't have business cards. I, I go, oh, I'm all out. I said, here, and I gave him my number. And in January of that year, now kiosk was almost, you know, a complete failure, basically. I borrowed money from my ex-bookie to buy Christmas presents that year. And by the way, the reason he was my ex-bookie, he said, if you quit gambling, I'll borrow you money. I mean, that, I mean that's, uh, you know, he cared. <laughs> and, uh, so this guy called me in January and he says, are you the guy that invented this pillow? The one guy I gave my phone number to. And I go, yeah. And he goes, this pillow changed my life. He says, it is a miracle. And he was all about that. I'm going, okay. And, he, and I'm excited hearing his, you know, not worrying about where I am at, that this is, I'm going, I was just so happy for him that it helped him. And he goes, I run the Minneapolis Home and Garden Show. Would you like a spot in there? And I go, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself right away, well, the kiosk didn't work. And I'm going, I go, well, maybe there's more people or something, you know, and I'm going, sure. Well, I didn't have money, and, and uh, so of course I had to borrow money to get into there. But then um, I go into that home and garden show, but what I did is I got behind that booth. I could sell. And once I got behind, it was, whoo, it was like, wow. And as I'm seeing people, they would literally come back the next day. So many people after that first day go, this is a miracle. And the same thing the guy said. Now I'm feeding off this passion and I'm just, it was like amazing where that I realized I could sell and I could sell and help people. And I sold out that four days, sold out. I was, and I'm going, wow, I can, this is where I'm gonna be. I can support my family in spite of everybody turning me down. So I started doing home shows and fairs and got in the Minnesota State Fair. We blew it out of the park, we're still there. And as they say, the rest is history. But that's a tad bit blasé for this story. There were more trials to come. And the story of Mike Lindell, an American Dreamer story, as good as any we've done. Where will you hear the rest of the story here on Our American Stories. Return to the life story of my pillow founder, Mike Lindell. I had this mask on, and probably from when th from the divorce from childhood. I always had to have. That's when I got a hold of cocaine. It was so easy. I, everything I did, I had to be on cocaine to be able to talk to people and be able to have my confidence because I have this unworthiness inside of me that a lot of people have from you know from different things that have happened. It's an unworthiness and. Now, when I quit all my drugs and everything, that was, it's been quite a journey to where now, I mean, if you'd have told me I would be speaking in front of people or doing a commercial, 
I would have said, there is no way. In fact, I did a little human interest story once at a local station. I was still on drugs at the time. It was 2005 or six. And this little public access station in Minneapolis, I came down there and she goes, uh, um, hey, this uh, host he was going on, she says, you want to go on his show right now? I want you, I go, I'm not going on the show. And she goes, and she goes, no, I want you just the way you are at the home shows. And I said, well, I'll come back in an hour because I want to go get my drugs, right? So, and she goes, no, go on right now. So she talks me into going on. Now, I was so petrified. Anybody that knew me said, you didn't have drugs, did you? And anybody that didn't know me said, what, is he on drugs? You know what I mean? Because I was so, like, I was all over the, the I've never been so nervous. I was just couldn't even talk. And I never forgot that. And I'm going, well, if you'd have told me then, oh, you, you don't need all this and you're going to be an amazing, you know, speaker and all this stuff. I'm going, okay, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> and yet, there was one place in Mike's life where he didn't need the drugs. Where he was home. Interesting with the home shows, um, you know, I, I noticed one thing when I was behind that table and people came up, they had a reason for me to talk to them. Now, if I left behind the booth, I didn't have to have drugs. That was the only, it was like a phenomenon. Now, if I went out to smoke cigarettes outside the door and there's three people there, I wouldn't even go near them. I'd have to, because I wouldn't want to talk to them. You follow me? I wouldn't want to talk to them. So it would be, when I was behind that, behind that table, talking about my pillow, I was in a, it was like a, you know, this amazing new thing where I could talk to people. And so I didn't need that. But obviously if I had cocaine, it would be, it would be you know, the same. But what I noticed, I could have the same passion with, with the cocaine or without, only in one spot behind that booth. Once I left that booth, I mean, it's like walking into another world. I'd walk, if I'm in the, I'm, and I have to talk to you and you're the next booth over, and we're gonna talk about the weather, it's not happening. I'm clamming up, I'm avoiding, I'm going, hey, yeah, we'll talk to you later. I didn't know what to say. I was very socially stunted in that respect where I probably have the social skills of a 12-year-old. The home shows were the one place in Mike's life that was certain. It was his world, his pillow. Not the uncertain world outside those doors where he was damaged by his parents, the drugs, and an unknown future. The shows were the place where he could feel that he was a positive force in this world. For me, I didn't have money. It didn't matter if I had money. I would, I had a skill. I could go out and get money. If I borrowed money, I would pay you back double because I couldn't, I couldn't accept anything from anybody. I have another wound where I don't accept. I'm a giver, but I can't accept, which I've worked on. You know, I can't accept if we were gonna, if we were gonna go to lunch. Guess what? I'd have a hard time you buying me lunch. That's the way you know I am, and that's a wound. That's actually, it's not a healthy thing either. It's be able to accept is also uh, just as good as blessing someone but I couldn't accept, especially back then. If you and I were doing drugs, I'm not taking some of your drugs, you're taking mine, you know. But to be able to be in that pillow show and to just see people coming up, I just felt like God gave me the idea for the pillow in the first place. I'm going, wow. I wouldn't get depressed because of that. It was like a constant feed of people going, this is amazing. You know, I had this with my neck and this and I'm getting sleep now. I knew it was such a divine solution. I could have sat and just, help people forever and never got, I wasn't thinking like, okay, I'm gonna make millions of dollars. My thought was always, I'm gonna help millions of people. There's a difference. But to reach his fullest potential in helping people, there was just one person that he had to help first, himself. It was March of 2008 when he was brought to that intervention. By the three biggest drug dealers of Minneapolis, of all people. That might have woken some people up, but not Mike yet. His Christian faith was always there, but it floated in and out of his heart. He grew up in a non-denominational Christian church and never had a real relationship with Christ. An interesting thing happened a week after that um little intervention I'm sitting all by myself at this place I was living and I get a phone call now from remember I, we talked about that little public access station 
And that lady was a nice Christian lady. She would air it just every now and then, at, you know. And I would get phone calls of people wanting to buy pillows then, you know. So it was helping me out. And, and uh, well, that night, it's about 9.30 at night, and the phone rings. And I answer, and, and I'm up doing, you know, of course, I'm still up for probably two, three days. And she says, you know, I, I'm, are you the guy I've seen on Channel 6? And uh, I said, yeah. She says, well, she says, God, God, I prayed and God told me to call you and say what you're doing is so important to the kingdom. Can, can we pray about it? And, we, and I said, okay, so we're praying. About a half hour goes by and she goes, she, I say, you know, goodbye. And I still have her name, you know, by the way, for this, you know, the proof that this happened. About another hour goes by, another lady calls up. And, and this never had happened, okay? I really got one call to buy a pillow. And she calls up, she says, are you the guy seen on Channel 6 that invented this pillow? And I said, yeah. She goes, well, I haven't bought one, and, and, but she said, um, I was going to call and see if it's okay to pray with you. She said, and what you're doing is so important to, the, to God. And I'm going, okay. And so we pray for about an hour. That was a long one. And we prayed, and I talked to her. I had nothing. You know, I'm doing lines of cocaine. I wanted someone to talk to anyway, you know. And um, now three in the morning, this guy calls up, same night. And he calls up, and he answers, and he goes, I want to get you the guy on TV. And he was mad. And I go, yeah. He goes, I goes, let me get something clear here. I don't believe in God, but I keep getting this dream that I'm supposed to call you and tell you what you're doing is important to God. And he slams the phone down, very upset. Now about seven in the morning, the phone rings and, uh, and I get on there, I go, you don't want to buy a pillow, you want to pray. And she goes, well, how did you know? And I'm going, it seems to be the thing tonight, you know? And, and uh, she ended up buying a pillow though too, <laughs> but, but we, so we prayed. So that day I'm going, wow, you know, and I knew that this platform, then my sister called me up a week later. She says, you got to quit standing in front of semis and think that God's going to pick someone else for this. He, he chose you for some, for a big calling. My sister is telling me this and I'm going, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I heard that last week, you know. <laughs> and, she, and she goes, you have a calling. And, this, and she said, this window is going to close and God's going to choose someone else. And you're, and, but then I'm kind of thinking, well, if I'm chosen for this, I can surely wait, you know. So I procrastinated through the year. And when, when we talk about bottom, for me, I wouldn't really have a money bottom because I've survived. You know, addicts are survivors. Any addicts that are out there, addictions are so... There's a lot of work. They're so hard to maintain them, to hide your addiction, to get enough to make money to get your drugs. I mean, there's just so, it's a lot of work. And most addicts are very smart. They're gonna get what they want. And when we come back, we're gonna hear the rest of this remarkable story. And I just love the line that I, I never got into this thing to make millions out of it, Mike Lindell said. I thought, I'm going to help millions of people. And that's a big difference, he said. And it is. And of course, we've heard that from so many of our American dreamers. And that's where money comes from in this great country. When you help other people, they pay you for the service voluntarily. And then, of course, the faith element of this story is equally impressive, maybe even more. And you're going to hear the rest of this story, and it just keeps getting better, folks. Our American Dreamers segment, Mike Lindell's story, My Pillow story. Here on Our American Stories. Now let's return to the final portion of our American Dreamer series, Mike Lindell's story, the founder of My Pillow. It would get to December of 2008, and an interesting thing happened. My friend that had quit for three years, his name is Dick, and he was the first guy I ever did cocaine with in 1984. But he had been free of everything and had found Jesus for three years, and I hadn't seen him for a year. Okay. He used to be one of my dealers, all right? 
And now he's the only guy on the planet. You know, I've been to treatment centers and stuff through my life for different things, gambling, uh, drugs, alcohol, to get my license back. And he's the only one that could have came there where I could ask him questions where I would respect the answer because he's been there. Well, anyway, here comes Dick and he walks in the door. He says, I said, Dick, what are you doing here? He says, God sent me out here. He says, what's going on? And I'm going, well, as long as you're here, I got a few questions for you. One of the first things I asked him is, is it boring? And that was a big question on the addicts because a lot of addicts think with addictions, it's, it's because you're bored. It's not, you're hiding pain. You're hiding pain and you're doing it, you know, you're all that, whatever you're doing on the, for the high, it's just masking the pain. But so I was very concerned about, is it boring? Then he left, that was in December of 08. Now, on January 16, 2009, I sat there and I'm going, okay, it was just like they used to have black and white TVs. When you turned them off, there'd be that little tiny dot and you turned it back on before that dot went out, right? And, and in my mind, I just knew that if I waited one more day, I, someone else would be chosen. And at the same time, I thought, you know what? This is gonna help so many people because this is gonna be, God's gonna show the best comeback or the best with God, all things are possible ever. This story, this story is gonna be an amazing story. I actually thought that the day I quit. And so I prayed, I said, God, I wanna wake up in the morning and free me from all these addictions. I don't ever want to feel them that, you know, the desire, free me from the desire. And uh, I said, then I'm all yours, I'll do this platform. That was my thing. So I'll do this, you know, whatever you want me to do. So I wake up in the morning and it's gone. It was a piece, it was like, wow. I didn't have any money. I told my friends and family, let's all pool our money and do this infomercial dream I had. If nobody's going to take my pillow, let's bring it right to the people. And I didn't know that infomercials don't work. It's just to get in box stores. You don't make money on the front end. But I, nobody told me that. It's like an old Gilligan's Island episode. When Gilligan's up flying and the skipper goes, Gilligan, get down here. You can't fly. And Gilligan says, I can't. And he crashed to the ground. He was flying just fine until somebody told him he couldn't do it. Well, nobody told me I couldn't make this infomercial and couldn't make it, you know, amazing. In my head, I'm going, this is going to be the biggest ever. I'm telling my friends and family. Mike says that in a dream, there were specific numbers about this hypothetical infomercial success that came to him. I'm going to go to a million dollars a week or two million overnight. A wild success for something that pretty much was at nothing. But here we go. And someone introduced him to a so-called expert. I said, I have this dream in this infomercial with just a real audience. And I didn't want to be in I didn't want to be in TV. I said, maybe somebody do it like we do at home shows. You know, just make it real. And she goes, no, you need an actor. And she says, then they wrote a script. The phones are lighting up like Christmas trees. I wanted to throw up. I said, this is not what I want. And she goes, I'm a professional and all this. But now the money kept going down. Almost all the money we had got from my friends and family that everyone put their life and just believe in me was almost, we were running out. We didn't even have anything. So divine appointment, I met this other guy. So he's going to do this infomercial. Well, it turned out I was going to do it because he had seen so much passion, this guy says, you need to do it. Then all of a sudden they had wrote this script and I went to read it, they had this big professional guy had come in and he's sitting there and he's listening to me read off this script and then her and he goes, this is the worst disaster ever. This guy is terrible, okay, being me, you know. This is, it's, they didn't know what to do so they, they decided they would go with no teleprompter. That Mike would try ad-libbing the whole infomercial. It will also become a hard surface, and it's no good. <laughs> what about this one? This one here is Ruined America. Um, oh my God. So we go in there to film it, and I was so scared. But once again, I got behind that counter, and it was like a shield between me and the audience where I come my comfort zone. And I just went naturally or whatever. Now on October 7, 2011, I'm living in my sister's basement and, and this aired at three in the morning and all of a sudden this half hour infomercial comes on and I'm going, wow. I'm watching myself, you know, usually I would get so uncomfortable, but I'm going, I hadn't seen it yet. I had not seen it. I had not, I couldn't watch it. So this is the first time I watched it. 
and it was surreal. And it wasn't like, ooh, I'm on TV. It was like, wow, this is like divine. Wherever you set that, you get exactly what you need for your individual neck support, yep. okay? That's you can turn this any way you want. You can make little balloon animals out <laughs> if you want. Okay, it's going to hold. It takes six pounds of pressure to hold that. It was just all natural. That It was like, it was real. It was what I wanted. I didn't want it to be a cookie cutter, you know, infomercial. And we exploded. We went from five employees to 500 in 40 days. We were hiring people as fast as we could. We were working out of a little schoolhouse. We made our own call center because I, I had trained a call center in Connecticut. I had trained them because I take customer service so seriously. I called on the second day. I said, yeah, what's in that pillow? The guy goes, I don't know, Google it. I fired him on the spot. I was so upset. And, and we made our own call center in a little schoolhouse. We put everybody, my friends, everybody came in and we took phones through the night. And I look back now and I say, everybody got their pillows in time for Christmas. I mean, we, we were making them, hiring people, teaching them how to sew. Can you sew? Yeah, here. They go, Mike, you need to be CEO. I go, that sounds horrible. Don't they just take money? And then, I, and then I go, we need an HR department. I go, that really sounds bad. I mean, all these things, I just wanted to make pillows, you know? And we took in millions of dollars over the next six months. But the experts continued to tell him that his way was stupid. They're going, did you make this ad? This is, this is terrible. Did you write this yourself? We can do so much better, blah, blah, blah. And uh, now it's the number one ad in history. I look it up. I'll put it up against any ad ever. Mike's ad-libbed infomercials that the American people have responded to because he's genuine and real are now selling over 75,000 my pillow products a day. And people said, oh, Mike, you can't make a pillow here in the United States. You got to make it overseas. I said, no, you're never going to get a patent on a pillow. And all these naysayers, and I fought every single thing. It was a constant fight. And the infomercial finally fatigued. And when it did fatigue, in the summer of 14, I thought, you know, it's over. I mean, it was just scary. We were, we were within two days of going under. Uh, during that time, and I, I had fell away from God. I didn't, uh, I mean, I was like, when I took in all that money, I'm going, wow, this is, you know, I kind of, kind of forgot about the platform that he had given me, and everything started to just dry up, okay? And in the summer of 14, I met Kendra. Mike's girlfriend. And... I noticed something with her that she had that I didn't have. It was, it was like this relationship with Jesus. And I wanted that. I really wanted that relationship or whatever she had. And on February 18th, 2017 is when Jesus showed up and I had this personal relationship now. I'm going, wow, now I have what Kendra has. Now I'm doing speaking all over the country. I have the same passion for the pillow as now I have for Jesus. And that's powerful. Why did the relationship finally come on this particular day? Operation Restored Warrior is actually for veterans. You go there, it's a five day thing where you're, uh, you give your life to Jesus. And you know, I was invited, like, you know, I'm not a veteran and I'm going, why? But they all prayed and we're gonna invite, we want, you know, God told them that we want Mike Lindell to come to this. And here I'm there, I'm going, I'm not, what am I doing here with these veterans? You know, these guys have stories that are 10 times worse than any story I have or any wounds. The wounds I heard there in their heart and Jesus showed up. I mean, I can't even tell you, it was the most divine. I'm walking out of there, I'm going, wow, this is what I was missing. This personal relationship where you're walking with him instead of just, you know, okay, I'm gonna go to church and believe in God. And you know, before all those times now I look back, all these chapters and all these things of my life, for me, it took all these things because I'm going, this doesn't happen unless it's of God. That the troubled son of divorced parents, the crack addict, the twice divorced father, the near bankruptcies, all of these trials and tribulations must have happened for a reason. That the odds of someone with this story selling 75,000 pillow products a day, meeting with the President of the United States in the White House, and sharing his Christian faith before a crowd of over 60,000 
in an NFL stadium after a life of fearing public speaking, this could have only happened for one reason and by one man. God's blessed me with this company. That ain't Mike Lindell. And what a great story about entrepreneurship and faith molded into one. Our American Dreamers series, as always, brought to us by the great folks at Job Creators Network. And go to ouramericannetwork.org to hear all that we do. We've done dozens of these American Dreamers series. This may be one of the best. Mike Lindell's story, my pillow story, here on Our American Stories. Our American Stories. 